them Tar Heels. They are the national champions. The year before, we was happy to be there. This year, we expected to be there, and uh, we had unfinished business. It wasn't this burden that we had to fulfill our destiny. It was something that, hey, we've worked really hard. We have this opportunity. Let's go out there and have fun. The most fun you'll have is when you have a chance to walk off that floor and somebody said you're the national champions. All the friendships and the, the different things we've seen and experienced have been beyond imagination. Our chemistry off the court is, is great. I think it's better than it is on, on the floor. It's just great to see the smiles on everybody's face. To know that I was a, a part of, of a national championship team in North Carolina is something that I'll remember forever. You know, all the hours that we put in in the gym, in the weight room, you know, conditioning. We just wanted to just work hard and just try to be the best we can be. Are we, are we tough enough to impose our will? And we had that, that kind of that hammer mentality, like we want to lay the hammer down from the start. There was no doubt that we hit everybody right between the eyes before they knew what happened. This is ours, we can, we can actually win this. You went through a lot of stuff and you're still here standing and you're a national champion. And proud you know, of all the hard work we put in. There's nothing that people can say about this team now because we got it done and we did it. To be able to sit up there and watch one shining moment with your teammates holding the national championship trophy is, you know, it's a fairy tale ending. I didn't believe this team was destined to win, but I thought it was the right thing. And uh, sometimes the right thing does happen. 65, but it was really 64. 64. 64. Right. And then it went to 32. 32. 32. Okay. Divide by two. 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 Divide by two.
Outside the program, the talk turned to undefeated seasons and that anything short of a national championship would render the season a failure. In early November, the Associated Press tapped Carolina as its first ever unanimous preseason number one team, matching the first ever unanimous ranking in the USA Today ESPN coaches poll from a week earlier. Unanimous, no one doesn't think you're going to win it. It's pretty rare company. Definitely when everyone announced they were coming back, we were like anointed, you know, kings of college basketball. They're going to win the national championship, this and that. And we kept telling everybody, everybody on paper, yes, we do have the best team coming back, but you know, you don't play the game on paper. I've never been around any team uh, that had the stress, the pressure uh, put on it like the expectations were for the 2019. I don't, I've never seen anything like that in college basketball, even in 84, and we knew we were really going to be good, but you didn't have that much media attention, the internet, the talk shows, and things like that. But, you know, we really never had long discussions about uh, just the amount of pressure that you feel. You know, you may have it internally, you feel it, but you, know, you really just kind of, hey, let's just keep moving forward. We know, let's work hard. And I fought it all year for my team to try to keep it away from the team. Let's enjoy the journey, let's enjoy each day, let's play for each day, let's play for every game. And yet in the back of my mind, I still knew it was there. In addition to fighting off outside expectations, the Tar Heel head coach had injury problems to manage right from the start of preseason practice. Senior Marcus Ginyard had surgery to repair a stress fracture in his foot in early October and was expected to miss the first two months of the year. Then on October 30th, the school announced that returning National Player of the Year, Tyler Hansbro, who had been nursing a stress reaction in his shin for much of the fall, was sidelined indefinitely with the injury. And Tyler was getting treatment for it, and it was one of those things that, you know, it progressively you know, got a little bit more sore over the weekend that we had. Um, it was the late night, and we had a lot going on, running from one gym to the next gym and early morning practice, and just kind of pushed it over the edge. When it first came out, I was, to be honest with you, I couldn't sleep. I thought, man, here's my senior year. I'm, you know, I'm done. You know, I'm, you know, should have gone to the NBA. Or at one point, I thought that. The one thing with Tyler, it's always been, you got to back off at certain times and say, hey, you know, take a day off. This is a time issue. It will get better with time and, and rest and appropriate loading. Well, what do I do? I mean, after two days of doing nothing, you know, it's like I have to do something. So I go get in the pool. And the hardest part for me was just taking time off. I'm just one of those guys. I can't, I can't take time off. I was convinced if we needed to sit him out for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, that uh, I, I, I would do that. I would have not had any problem. But then when. We can play him, and we're trying to get him ready. That was that was the big tough time for me. I watched him a lot just to see, you know, if he winced, if he grabbed at his leg, if he rubbed at his leg, you know, just little things that tip you off that, yeah, maybe it's bugging him today. It was a pressure uh, that I didn't break his leg by making him do one more drill than he needed to do. We don't always know how much is too much, you know, especially in a in a tough, driven, competitive athlete. This drill we're going to do and boxing out in the break for eight minutes. And after seven minutes, I'd either take him out or maybe we should stop and go on because we've gotten through seven minutes without hurting him. Let's don't push our luck. My shin, it, it ached and throbbed after games until after the Valpo game. When I went home and had a, a straight, straight week of rest. Everybody improved their game while Tyler was out. I mean, we had to win games. We had other, other options on the team, like Danny was knocking down threes. Deion even started playing a lot better. Wayne played better, knocked down shots. And even the, uh, the young fellas, Ed and uh, Zeller, they came in and played big minutes. So, I mean, you kind of need that to um, let everybody show what they can do. Up and under, can't hit it, but Ed Davis dumps it home on the rebound. And Ed Davis went up above Will Graves, who was trying to get the offensive rebound. Ed said, give me that. Just with him being out, I think it just was just a time for me to see that I can play on this level, on a high level, and actually be successful and help a team win. Off 
it goes to Harris. Harris blocked by Deion Thompson. He's been so active offensively, defensively. I think that's the big statement game we wanted to make in the beginning of the year so everybody that we're here and we're ready to play this year. Lawson off to Zeller. Missed the slam dunk and he got fouled by Ramon Harris. Zeller's getting to his feet. No, uh oh he's hurt. Carolina's injured list continued to grow as the Tar Heels headed west to California and then on to Hawaii for the Maui Invitational. Tyler Zeller's broken left wrist would need surgery and could be a season ending injury. There was some good news though for the Tar Heels as Tyler Hansbro would make his season debut in front of a raucous crowd at Cal Santa Barbara's Thunderdome. That's the weirdest injury I've ever had, just because it didn't really bother me until the next day. Because sometimes I sprain my ankles in a game, my ankle in a game, and it's just, I wake up the next day and it's fine. And I, I don't know what it is. Uh, it doesn't really bother me long, but that one really kind of lingered on. And, you know, it, it, it bothered me pretty much until mid-season. coming at you, we got busted lips, old men knees, all kinds of stuff going on, all right, but you competed, and that's what it's got to be. Sometimes you got to win up with it, all right, and you do that by defending better and rebounding better. We can do a lot better than we did tonight, but I like the way you competed. No trip that's better. Now he's a fantastic place to be. You have Thanksgiving dinner over there, especially after a championship when you play play great uh, for three straight games. Um, you know the weather's fantastic, and uh, the whole experience is something that I know the guys will remember for a long time. I'm always a blast. Uh, it's one of my best memories from Carolina uh, to be able to play in Hawaii. That whole experience out in Maui was just amazing. Just being out there, my family from California was there. Just, I'd never been there, being in Maui, that was my first time there, the water, beaches, all that, all that good stuff. It was, it was just fun being there, 80 degrees every day, then it was like, it was cold back home. We do play well in Hawaii, and I think it's because I threatened them. I say, if you play the way you're supposed to play, we're gonna give you a lot of free time, you're gonna have some fun. If not, we're gonna be in the gym a lot, and you'd hate to spend all your time in Maui in the gym. It was a lot of fun playing that game, you know, being able to score some points and seeing everybody else do well. saying, well, what do you think, big fella? And I mean, he wanted to play so badly. I mean, it was, it was I want to play, so I'm fine. And I said, well, what do you think? And he wouldn't even let me get the statement. I'm fine. There's been comparisons of me and Heron Goaty, you know, pretty much, I think ever since, you know, last year where he's kind of had a breakout year. Like Tyler, he was fired up because we always used to call uh, Heron Goaty 
the uh, poor man's Tyler Hansbro. We make jokes of like Harry Goody's coming for you. We call him like the bootleg Tyler. Like, Some of my teammates call me Hans Goody. Here's another big guy that people are comparing him to. And he wanted to show people there was a difference between him and the other big guy. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of end right there, to be honest with you. It was a big game. First real game of the season. We all wanted to show the world how good we were. And uh, we went out there and, and played real well. Thompson with a rebound. Thompson clears it away. The pass to Ed Davis. Slapped away by Heron Goody. Recovered by Tyler. Oh, he took it right back on Heron Goody for the dunk. I saw the ball on the floor and I just picked it up and went up with it. And Heron Goody jumped with me and I dunked on him. So it was, it was it definitely was good. And, it was, that's one of the, probably the highlight of my season for me right there is when, when that happened, but besides winning the national championship, of course. I still think that's one of my best games in college right there. But at that time, Notre Dame's picked in the top ten in the country. And, uh, you know, we'd beaten Oregon easily, and then uh, Notre Dame was, you know, 30 points at one time or something like that. And so that was a pretty good message to everybody. Bobby drops it off the green. Here's a long three. All Coach Williams can do is say, son, you were way too far if you had missed that shot. I didn't know how deep I was. I, I was pretty far out. I just caught the ball, and it was, it was a heat check. And when I caught it, I just, you know, if I'm open, I'm going to shoot it. You can see in his face, he wasn't too happy when I released it. But when it went in, of course, he relaxed a little more. It's one of those shots where you're like, oh, no. And then it's like, oh, okay, you know, good shot. The guy makes five in a row. I don't care about that next one. Go ahead, big fella. Try it and see what happens. Uh, we wanted to come out there and make a statement. Uh, Michigan State, we knew there was another top team, so we wanted to make, have a good showing there. We played against them, and uh, we came out real strong and uh, played real well that game. Here's Lawson with an outside three, good! Green with a rebound, outlet going to Ellington. Allen trying to cut him off, and Ellington gets the slam with a right hand. Now Hansbro recovers, Hansbro turning. His shot's good, and he's fouled. Right before half, I said, they're done. You know, if we keep the hammer down, this one is, is going to be over with early in the second half. And then we came out early in the second half, you know, because I think it was only 13 or 15 or something like that at half. But we came out early in the second half, and then it was, uh, then it was that snowball rolling down the hill getting bigger. Oh, my goodness, on the inbound from baseline right, Lawson drops it into Will Graves, and he gets the slam dunk. And the ball gets stolen by Lawson. He gives it to Thompson for the slam dunk. There's our fifth double-figure scorer of the night. And that's seven steals for Kyle Lawson. You know, we knew that we had a chance to get back there um, if we played the way we had been, which was playing defense. That's what we wanted to do, um, make a statement on that floor, and hopefully so we can come back later that year and everybody know that we came through there and played real well. So, I mean, that's what we did.
heading into just his 10th game of his senior season. Tyler Hansbro had the chance to break Phil Ford's 31-year Carolina scoring record. He wouldn't have known about it if the media or anyone didn't tell him about it. The day of the game, uh, my whole team's in the locker room playing Mortal Kombat on Xbox. Tyler's going nuts, calling Larry a cheater because he beat him. Uh, so I don't think he was really worried about worried about the record or the game or anything. Now to Hansbro, face up, jump shot, good. That's four. Thompson in the lane, got it to Hansbro, face up jumper, good. He's got six. Here's Hansbro. Got it. It was only a two, so he tied the record. Right back to Hansbro. Hansbro, right baseline, forces up the shot. He's the all-time leading scorer in Carolina. really special. Um, I mean, uh, you know, you see Phil Ford in his jersey every day in the rafters and, and all the things that he's, you know, has accomplished and, you know, how everybody kind of, you know, perceives Coach Ford around here and, uh, for all the things that he's done. And uh, that was special that he came back to watch me and, and break that record. You know, I really want to, you know, say thanks to, first of all, to my teammates and my coaches and, and Coach Williams when he recruited me. Um, I never dreamed I'd be here being the all-time leading scorer at you know, such a great university that I love to represent. This is a great honor to be here and to represent you guys every night in this uniform. Thanks a lot. This really means something to me. So appreciative of Phil coming back and being here, uh, but that was a thrill for me. And people can sit there and you know, 1978 to 2009. My, I'm really good at math. I tell the guys that all the time. That's 31 years. And when you talk about North Carolina basketball, uh, for someone who is really old, you're not going to talk about North Carolina very much anymore unless you mention Phil Ford and Tyler Hansbro. And to have both of them. Uh, uh, there in that hug and uh, you know I think Phil was uh, uh, touched by it and I know Tyler really felt great about Phil being there so that was uh, that was a huge point for me as a North Carolina fan and as the North Carolina coach. He's the most competitive and driven and focused young man I've ever coached. Most kids don't have that kind of goal they don't have that kind of focus and he's kept it for four years I mean his eating sleeping stretching you name it He's done it to help himself in basketball, and it's all paid off for him, and that's what's so rewarding. When I first came here, uh, you know, I was a good high school player, and I think every high school player, when they, they get recruited by North Carolina, they all have dreams about coming here and do, doing big things, and that's, honestly, that's exactly what I thought. I thought I was going to be a, a big-time player here, and, and I, I never imagined I'd have the impact that I did. He was a four-year All-American, but at the same time, each year he did improve and expand his game. Uh, you know, I think uh, when it's all said and done, you look at his progress, there was a lot of progress made on and, on and off the court. You know, as a person, he came in and he's very shy and reserved. To this day, he's probably a little shy and reserved, but I think he has definitely come out of the shell and, and grown up a lot. People don't see all the hours of work that he has put on behind the scenes. So I've, I've joked, I, I see him more than my wife, and uh, it's just countless hours. I think he's a big part of where, why I got to where, I, where I'm at in my college career. You know, he's definitely changed my, my mindset on, that, on weightlifting and he's really taught me a lot about what to eat and, you know, how to eat and how to take care of your body. It was like their second workout and he hadn't said a word the whole time he's here. Yeah, I remember we were doing wall sits. Tyler was just the one pushing through it. He just started screaming and yelling at the other guys to not give up. and. And I started screaming. I said, man, you're, you're, you're psycho, man. You're, you're, you're Psycho T. And it stuck with him. So that's, that's how the name Psycho T came along. I think, he, I think he actually liked it. 
He's incredibly humble and, and selfless. He gets all these awards and, and couldn't care less about, I mean, it's obviously a great honor to have, and he knows that and understands that in the company that he's in, but you know, just the way he reacts to it, you know, he deflects the, the praise to his, to his teammates. And then we were talking about his jersey being hung in the, in the rafters. I said, that's pretty cool. I, th I thought I was gonna be good, but never imagined I'd be where I am. And uh, to realize that and being there with, you know, some of the greats like Antoine and Jordan and Phil and those, it's, it's, a, it's quite an honor. When you play with a guy like Tyler Hands, bro, who's broken every record at Carolina, broke NCAA records, his jersey retired at Carolina. I mean, I mean, that's something to be proud of. It's definitely an honor to be on, on the same team with, with a guy like that. That'll probably be the first thing I say when I tell people about, you know, my college days and where I play. Oh, yeah, I play good. Play Carolina on the team with Hansbro, you know, when, when he's beating up everybody. When I have kids and grandkids, I'm gonna take them into the Smith Center, point up to the rafters, rafters at the number 50 jersey and say, I live with this guy, I was really close friends with him. Um, we won a national championship together. Winning the national championship is by far, doesn't compare to any other awards I've won, just because it's something that I've done with the team. And, you know, you have those relationships with all the guys that you room with and, and everything through college. And, and it's like you've done something with them. And then for us to share that, you know, that title together, you know, that was, that was big for us. What Tyler stood for, not just for Roy Williams, but for college basketball, put him in a, in a, in a different uh, context. You know, when you hang a banner, it's a little different than when you win national player. Yeah, some people know you win national player year, but everybody in the world pretty much knows when you win a national championship and, you know, where, what team you, you play on. Tyler Hansborough won his last high school game, and Tyler Hansborough won his last college game. And there's not many people who say that. Not many of my family and friends have gotten down to Chapel Hill to see me, and so for, to see everyone wearing the number four t-shirts and having a whole section of family and friends at the United Center and, uh, was pretty fun. Weak side pass, Frazier, long shot, good! Bobby Frazier, Frazier from outside, got a second three-pointer. Play well, knock down some shots, have a couple assists, uh, some steals, and you know, it was just, I was just having fun out there like I did when I was playing ball in Chicago in high school. For the first time in nearly three months, Marcus Ginyard is on the floor. This long three, an air ball, but recovered, and Ginyard puts in a reverse layup. In those three games, I just felt like I was battling more against my foot than I was the other team. And, uh, you know, when that was the first thought, um, you know, in your mind when you're out there moving, uh, you know you're not going to be as focused for the game, and, and you're not going to be able to uh, compete and, and perform at the level that you're used to. Drew on the drive, fingertip roll, in the lane is good. Ginyard saves it, got it to Hansbrough from the dunk. Carolina lead is 20, pressure now to the target, nearly stolen by Frazier, they got it down, oh, oh blocked by Danny Green. Brandon Fields went up with it, Green blocked it. My favorite block is this thing in Nevada maybe, or I had to really chase the guy all the way, all the way down. Yeah, it was a far run. I kind of hurt myself in the process. I think I hurt my heel when I came down. Carolina was 13-0 with an average margin of victory of nearly 27 points a game heading into ACC play. That prompted many followers of college basketball to wonder whether or not the Tar Heels could possibly go undefeated. That question was quickly answered as Carolina was humbled first at home by Boston College and then at Wake Forest to fall to 0-2 in league play for the first time in more than a decade. Whenever you hit, you know, start the ACC play and these young guys realize what the ACC is about, like, you know, I think Ed and Larry and, and uh, you know, some, you know, even some of the veteran guys, I think sometimes you get happy whenever you're number one and you're undefeated and you just think you can roll over people. I think we were shocked uh, by how emotional uh, and how uh, uh, good BC was. You know, they hadn't done anything to make you think that. And, and I still remember, you know, they come out and Sanders makes three threes with pretty good defense on it. And he hadn't shot them that well all year long. But we know we're going to get everybody's best shot. Uh, that Tyrese was really good. 
uh, that we didn't have our best game, but that they played at a level higher than they had played previously. Now Green to Drew, inside it goes to Thompson, and he gets another slam. going to that game they only averaged maybe four threes for the game and I think they probably hit that within the first you know, eight minutes or so or five minutes. And they it was just into their groove the whole game like Jeff T got out early had 17 18 points first half and just controlled the whole game. We didn't play very well and we had a chance to win the daggum game. Graves with a long outside shot good timeout with 4.7 seconds left 91 to 89. Next one is no good. Rebounded Carolina. Pushed away to Graves. Graves fires from the backcourt. Went over the top of the backcourt and it's all over. Wake Forest wins. When we were 0-2 uh, in the locker room at Wake Forest, and, and uh, you haven't heard me say this very often. I mean, I think that was the, the wisest thing I have ever done, the best thing I've ever done. I don't usually talk about I, uh, but I think that was a that was a big moment to get our kids to understand if you just do what I ask you to do, we'll be there at the end. And I believed it. And he stood up uh, and he asked Coach Rob, he said in 1991, um, I don't know what year it was, he said we started off with the conference 0-2. And, and he asked Coach Rob, he said, what did, how did we finish? And he said, we were playing on Monday night. It's a marathon and uh, you know, you got to get back out there and we, we'll be fine. We just got to keep working and everybody else got to keep working. Uh, just don't panic and let's just keep doing what we've been doing and just do it better. I think he gives I think he gives kids more confidence than you can ever imagine. His faith in us didn't waver at all. He knew if we continue to do what they, they told us to do and continue to get better and better each day of practice that that Monday night that we would be there playing for the national championship. In the Wake Forest locker room about we'll be there at the end where they weren't nearly as concerned as the fans were for sure and maybe not even as concerned as the coaches were. That was the most important stretch of the season because we were teetering a little bit. And I think uh, our staff, again, trying to be so positive and let's just do this. And we did take it one at a time. Up to Drew, put the pass underneath to a wide open Ed Davis. from the outside. Just did. Oh, what a dunk follow by Danny Green. So Carolina earns its first ACC win of the season. We played with more intelligence tonight. And there was a sense of purpose about it, too. All those things we talked about the other day and everybody's expectations, that's everybody else. Have they invested the sweat that you have? No. Be concerned with this group right in here. And things are going to get better and better and better. That's one. That's one road win. All right? We get to go home Saturday. You know what we get there? One home win. One game at a time. Everybody's got to understand. The ACC is no slouch. I mean, every game is going to be a challenge and, and, and is competitive every single game in and game out. Dude, they came out firing. They came out gunning and and they came out playing really well. And if that continued on, it would have been a long night for us. Scooped up by McClinton, pitches ahead to Collins. Blocked from behind by Danny Green. Thompson wasn't ready for it. It bounced off his back, recovered, put it. Blocked by Danny Green. Those hustle plays, I think, you know, lifted our defense up a lot and definitely put the crowd into it. And when our crowd's behind us, it, it makes it a lot easier for us, you know, calm down and play our game. Get us momentum, get the crowd into the game or something. He just makes things happen. Ty made some big stops you know, on Jack Clinton, you know, stealing the ball at half court and, and, and throwing it ahead where Tyler gets easy, you know, two points. Uh, plays like that, it, you know, I think those, those two blocks kind of led to those big defensive stops that we needed. After the Virginia game, I met with Coach Williams, and he said, you know what, you just need to have one of those games where, 
You know, you just hit about three or four straight, and you're going to be fine from there. And it just so happened that the next game, that it happened for me. Here's Lawson to Ellington, out of the other corner. Good! Oh, there may be something going on. Wayne Ellington! <laughs> Whoa! Six in a row. He's got a smile on his face. He knows the flames are shooting out of his fingertips. It was, it was huge. And, uh, I think from there I got my confidence back, I got my, my rhythm back, and I just started going from there. Okay, here's another game. We've beaten Clemson so many times, and you know, and the expectations are up again, and you know, and now all of a sudden you gotta go out and you gotta do it. We knew it was gonna be a challenge going into it. We handle the, the, the pressure. The wing went off and exploded, and what he normally does against Clemson for the last three years. Wayne Ellington from the outside picks up where he left off. I can't, I don't know what it is with Clemson. You know, I just, I love Clemson. <laughs> I wish we played Clemson every game. The driving layup with a right hand is good by Ellington. Hey, Ellington is putting on a show tonight. I think it's just a style of, of play that they play. I mean, it's an open floor. It's, um, you know, they like to press a lot. They kind of forget about me. I get some wide open looks, and you know, as a scorer or shooter, when you get some open looks and you knock a few in, it, you know, you're rolling from there. That gave him more confidence, and I think that was uh, bigger than anything else. And everybody expected that. Everybody wanted to see that break out, and then they wanted to see it continue. It was tough for me early in the season. You know, I couldn't really get in the groove. I was trying to, you know. I would have a game that was pretty good, then I would come back and I would struggle a little bit. So getting off to a bad start, I kind of got down on myself rather than, uh, you know, rather than, you know, keeping it positive. And, and moving on to the next game or next play. He kept fighting and he kept coming in the gym, kept doing the extra shooting, kept doing the form shooting, kept sitting in the chair and getting the ball and shooting it with one hand, trying to make sure the technique was there. I've grown pretty much from that time as a player, you know, being able to you know, do some other things. You know, I improved my rebounding, I improved my, you know, making plays for my teammates. And I think those those couple of months kind of helped me if, if, you, if you look at it that way because, uh, you know, without that, you know, I probably would have still been, you know, sitting on the arc shooting threes, and rather than, you know, uh, you know, becoming more of a complete player. And then I think he started to say, you know what, I'm just, I'm just gonna go play. And then all of a sudden he explodes against Clemson and explodes against uh, uh, Miami. And I think from that point on, the light bulb was on and the confidence. You know, it's just like anybody else. It, you see the ball go through the net enough, you feel more confident in what you do, and then you can get back into who you really are. Go from the Florida State, baby! Tallahassee is, it's a fun place for me to play. I knew from the jump they were gonna play physical. And I told, I told everybody on the team that and they're gonna reach from behind, they're gonna poke the ball away from you, and we had a couple turnovers early on. And guys got shaken up a little bit. But you know, when it got physical, uh, and I felt like nobody else was really stepping up at the time, I felt like somebody needed to make some type of statement and step up and, and do something and let them know that we're not scared of them. Green's three-point shooting is keeping Carolina within hailing distance right now. A guy talking junk to you or, or you know trying to body you up it didn't scare me, so I just you know took it and used it as motivation like and just played my game and, and kind of helped me pick my game up a lot and. And once I started in shots, like I said, the game became a lot easier. He was uh, uh, one of those guys that sh he would make the big basket. The one that drove the dagger in there usually came from Danny. Douglas on the right side. He'll loop it back. Stolen by Danny Green. Danny Green going down. Kitchen will try to cut him off. Driving layup good. And Kitchen fouls him on the play. It happened on, on, on that night. Uh, I got there at the right time, got the steal, uh, and got fouled and finished the play, which was another lucky play because I thought the guy was going to let me go, which would have been a smarter play for them if he would just let me go because they were up three. But he fouled me, and the even luckier part was at the end of the game where Ty got the ball, dribbled full court, and shot a three-point floater. <laughs> Hansbro inbounds to Ty Lawson. Lawson coming quickly, front court drive, shoots a runner, good! Got it. Good! He got Did it. Did it count? Did it count? Yes, it's good! Carolina Funny. wins the game!
the play was I supposed to throw it to half court or something like that. And I remember I was like, man, even if that guy had half courts open, I'm giving it to Ty because I knew Ty could, he could go the whole length. And, uh, you know, so I gave it to Ty and he got that shot off. And, you know, I was so happy. And coaches told me if I get it, just run with it. So when I got it, I just turned to see that they gave me an open lane to the basket. So I took two dribbles, looked at the clock, saw it was one second left, and just let it go. And luckily it went in. You know, shut them up real quick. I mean, you go in there, they're all loud because they're close, and they think we're going overtime, and boom, it's over, it's done. And uh, that was exciting. It just felt good. I mean, that was a real bonding moment for the team because that's the first time I think we ever hit a game winner beside, like, with the clock at zero. So, I mean, everybody rushed the floor. It's the first time we've rushed the floor since we've been here. Every game that we win, somewhat, especially the close games, it shows a lot more how emotional guys get and how happy we are with that we, you know, stuck it out or grinded it out and won a, a close game. He hits that shot at Florida State and Tyler goes up and gives him this huge bear hug and just to see how happy he was that we won the game and that's all that mattered. This guy had his 55 game, I think it was 55 uh, straight games and double figures. He had that string broken, but he was so ecstatic with our team winning and I think that was important. North Carolina basketball is about team play. It's about working together. It's about the, you know, it's about the hard work. Uh, it's just not about just one guy and what one guy does. It's about our team being successful, our team winning. And I think the character of the kids allows them um, that opportunity to, to do that. Coach does a great job recruiting great people not just great players, but great people in there. The kids that come in here are good kids and they have great attitudes. We're a different type of team. You know, we do a lot of things off the court together. You know, we all get along great. And uh, that's, not, that's not the case on a lot of teams. Our chemistry off the court is, is great. I think it's better than it is on, on the floor. I think people see it. If you see us out or see us together, we're like brothers, we're like a big family. When we got to one at Virginia, I said, that's one road win. Okay, now we've gotten back that home game we lost, and we've added one. And, you know, going down the line, Florida State, that's another road win. Now we've gotten that one back and one. Now we've gotten another one. I would say NC State's top of my list. It's one of the schools I, I least like in ACC. It's just because they're fans, you know, so close to Raleigh and everything. You know, they just, it seems like they never leave you alone. Everywhere you go, they're hassling you. You know, ever since they beat us at State, I've, I've disliked them, you know, from the, them storming the court after we won and, you know, yelling and screaming and getting in our faces. It's that thing that, you know, you remember through your whole career and, and uh, you want to prove yourself and prevent that from happening ever again. So that's something that has driven me for every, every single game we've played State. from the field, 30 points. Put them away, and you did some nice things there, fellas. Good. Yes. Sandy Green walks away, Mosley's attempted layup. Here's Lawson, the alley to Deion Thompson. Here's Ellington for three. Yes! Number seven. Ellington for 32. Everything is going right in Mr. Ellington's neighborhood. Boy, what a smooth move that time. Green, off to Ellington. Ellington has a notion. Drive, scoops it up, it goes! Fancy playmaking. Wayne Ellington with 20.
by mid-February, Carolina had played its way back into contention for the ACC title. The Tar Heels rode a seven-game winning streak into Cameron Indoor Stadium as Carolina's senior class looked to make it four in a row at Duke. I remember talking to him again in the huddle the day before, and I said, you know, they're saying we're not going to beat them. They're saying the streak stops right here. Well, it's not going to stop just because they say so. We've got a hand in this as well. They don't know how well we're going to play. And so it was a little bit of trying to build our confidence, but uh, I really believed it. We've always had great focus on the road. I think our road record would show that over the course of these past four years. And um, playing at Duke even raised it that much more because there's so much energy, so much passion involved in it. Playing at Duke is definitely a lot of fun. And being able to walk out of it with no losses is, is, is even better. You know, um, to not experience a loss on that on that floor, especially when you're playing in games against big time guys when, when you're young, when you were freshmen. You know, you get so excited for that game, it's unbelievable. And, you know, I, th I think uh, just the excitement kind of blocks the fans out. And, you know, it's, it's no greater feeling than to go over there and beat them. As soon as we got off the bus and we walked in the locker room, you can just hear them in there chanting. This was like two hours before the game. And so that just gets you pumped up. Then going out there, you can barely breathe because it's so hot in there, then how loud they are. First half, we got two or three threes from Bobby. We got eight or nine points from Dion early. We weren't doing the things that we normally do to get our points. We got it from unexpected sources right there all of a sudden. One thing I know, I, I was always in Bob's ear, but I was, I was, hey, Bob, you know, be ready. When it's coming to you, you know, it's going in. Be ready to knock it down. Uh, Dion the same way. Hey, Dion, when you post it in there, you know, down low, you know, when you get the ball, a quick move, it's going in. The ball was going in the basket, and I was holding our team down to those guys got on track. And once Ty took over that second half, and everybody else started to jump on that 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 bandwagon that me and Bobby got going, that's a little spark plug we got going. It, we we looked good from there. Hit three threes in half and to be a big part of it, that's even more special. And so uh, to have a moment like that where you are a big part of a win, the team needed you. Uh, you know, it's kind of say, hey, yeah, I can still play. Ellington will inbound, got it to Lawson, nearly lost it. Skip pass over to Frazier, another three on the way, good! A third three for Bobby Frazier, he's got nine. Despite Carolina's fast start, Duke went on a 22-5 run and took an eight-point lead into halftime, setting the stage for an emotional scene in the Tar Heel locker room. Everybody thought I threw a chair, but I really kicked the chair. It kind of fired everybody up, you know, everybody got kind of lit everybody and was like, you know, yeah, let's go, you know, we should be playing better. We shouldn't, this shouldn't even be close, you know, we should be playing a lot harder and, you know, do the things that we're supposed to do. We thought we were a better team and we should have been up more or, or having a better lead or, or something like that at halftime. And I just thought, you know, when we came in the locker room, we kind of all said to ourselves, you know, even before came, coach came out and talked to us, we knew what we needed to do, and that was play defense and, and uh, stop some of their guys. First half, I really didn't play too well, and the coach was behind me. He was like, you got to attack, you got to play better. Um, you done it before. I got. He told me he had faith in me that game. He saw we had so much confidence that if you'll do this, we'll be successful, and then he did it. And I think that did give him more confidence. And, and uh, you know, we did see it down the line, whether it was at, you know, against LSU or whatever it was. But if we gave him space, he has such a great ability to penetrate the ball to the basket. Second half, I got the jitters out. Um, went to the basket. After I made the first couple of baskets, I felt like I was unstoppable. And uh, Greg Paul was going to stay in front of me. No guard that could stay in front of me. So I just went to the basket. Got fouled. Got in ones. As it kept going, I just felt like I got more and more confident. Lawson backing up a step or two. Now Lawson gave him a little fake drive, scoops oh. it up, scores, and gets fouled. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Did he use Singler that time? I think uh, one of Ty's thing is when Ty wants to play, I think he's he's one of, he's one of those players that, you know, when he turns it on and plays, you know, he can't do much about it. That second half of Duke, I think, really just did it for him. And I think in every second half of every game from there, it, it was Ty's time to take over the game. And, uh, that, that performance he had at Cameron in that second half was, was really good time. After that game was over, I had so much confidence. Even our team, I think we had a lot of confidence in ourselves that we can take any team out of what they want to do and we can just, uh, just play it as well as anybody in the country. Well, that was a great, great, great second half. Great second half. Oh, that way to get the ball to the rim. That's everybody, time. that's fantastic. Yes. That's, that's 10 million times better defensively. First half, we were awful. Second half, we showed what kind of team we can be. All right? God, I'm 
That's pretty good. Yeah. Hey, I'm ready for another. Yeah. 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 Carolina had to travel to Miami four days later, where Jack McClinton and the Hurricanes were poised for an upset. Ellington forces him to back up a little bit. Now here's McClinton driving right down the lane. Plays it up good. 30 points for McClinton. Ellington high post to Thompson. Now here's Lawson for three. Got it. Ty Lawson knocks down a big three. Recovered Green. Thompson back to Green. Here's Lawson for another three. Good. Ty Lawson with back-to-back -back threes against Green. Now it goes over to McClinton. Fake Lawson. Gets the shot away. Good. <laughs> Clinton and Lawson are really having a one-two punch to go at each other. Lawson continued to emerge as a late game scoring option with a little help from former Tar Heel point guard Raymond Phelps. But he just told me that I was a leader and when he was here he was a leader and that I need to be the leader. I need to take the big shots. I need to get to the basket and be more aggressive on offense. He and I always had this little thing that I was telling coming out of timeouts or something, manage the game. You know, and he said, I know, manage the game. I said, hey, you need to manage the game. Whether it was making a play or getting guys involved or getting getting the ball to, to people or just making plays to help our team. Ty Lawson brings it front court. Dew's still playing well off of it. Now Frazier moves out. Here's Lawson going right side. He'll give it up to Wayne Ellington. Back to Lawson. Lawson with a long shot. Good for three. Well, Ellington last time in the second half against Miami shoots seven three-pointers. This time, Ty Lawson is the story from behind the arc with five second-half three-pointers. You know, coaches always wanted Ty to score and score more. So people are trying to stop him. And that minute Wayne is running, then he's got the kick out to Wayne, and Wayne starts making shots, and all of a sudden, you know, we got the complete package working for the offense. You got scoring inside, you got you got transition baskets, you got pitcher heads and, and kick outs for wide open jump shot between he and you know, Wayne and Danny. Uh, so we kind of got you in the pickle. <clears throat> you know, especially if you're trying to guard us. Okay, how are you gonna stop us? You know, because it was became very, very difficult for people to stop us. Lawson break next speed down on the driving layup. Lawson for three. Good! Ty Lawson. Vasquez with his 33rd point of the game. It's a four-point game. Here's Lawson. Off the hands throw. Slapped away in a charge. Well, there's no question we went brain dead for a while. You know, whether it's at Miami or uh, at Florida State, we had done some nice things, late game situations, and then all of a sudden at Maryland, it's just like we forgot our brain for about four or five minutes there. As far as practice, we did practice. He thought we were getting uh, a little fat-headed and spoiled and reading our equipments too much and so forth and just getting down in the trenches again doing the dirty work. Later on, the practices may have gotten shorter time period-wise, but our intensity never let up after that game because we, we were disappointed in how we played. We were extremely disappointed about the uh, competitiveness and the savvy of our team at the end. And so uh, uh, our effort and execution, we still were looking for, but we were going to make darn sure that we, pu we pushed him as much as we could. Long pass, Ellington runs it down and then dunks it. Here's Hansbro in the right corner, jump shot, good. like you block um, the opponent's shot, the more like nervous he's gonna be next time and the easier it's gonna be because he's gonna be she's gonna try like to avoid it and that makes it easier on the shot blocker. And so after I got like my first like three or four and then that's when they really started like to be scared about it and so that's why it was just easier for me to pick him up. You know we had been coming off a, a loss where you know the perimeter exploded on us and um, you know we kind of put our foot down. You know we didn't we didn't want to have that anymore. We were sick of people criticizing our perimeter for not being able to guard guys, and um, you know we just wanted to come in and, and stop them. Uh, you know that was my emphasis, and I just wanted to go in there and not let him get any open looks. You know I wanted to chase him. He came off a lot of screens and just be there every time he caught the ball and, and kind of pest him. 
Uh, and coach always says, you know, guard people the way you don't want to be guarded. And I know when I come off screens and I'm trying to get open with guys right there, you know, it's something I hate. So that's something I try to do to him. Guys, I don't know about you, but that feels pretty doggone good. You've got to feel good about that. You've got to feel good. Coming in here, they're playing for their lives. They want to make the tournament. They were so disappointed last year, they should have made the tournament. They said last week we've got to beat Duke or North Carolina to make the tournament. We do that for him. All right. They didn't beat Duke. They didn't have thorns. They came back. They had everybody tonight. And you took their shot. And you made your shots. All right? That's fantastic. <laughs> The Tar Heels had been riddled with injuries all season long, and the news got worse late in the season as ACC Player of the Year Ty Lawson injured his right big toe in practice just two days before the final regular season game against Duke. Your whole season's riding on one guy's toe. I think I knew you know, the nature of the injury, even without hearing from the physicians, you just know that's a tough injury to deal with. It was going to be a battle to, to do what we needed to do to have him be effective. Lawson had never lost a game to Duke in which he played, but would the point guard be able to go against the Blue Devils? Well, that was the big question, even just minutes before tip-off. A pre-game meal, four hours before the game, I still didn't know. And in fact, at that time, I was skeptical if he was going to play. Well, he came down and out on the court before the people got in the stands and, and did some work and told the doctors he thought he could really go. Once they told me to give me a shot, I was going to play regardless because I, I knew that I wouldn't be able to feel it. And I didn't think it was that serious of an injury. He wanted to beat Duke about as much as anybody else and you know, cowboyed up is what I like to call it. The toughness question was out. It was not anything I considered after the Duke game because the youngsters showed a lot of toughness during that time period. The uncertainty around Lawson's availability was not the only stress producer heading into the Duke game as the 2009 senior class. What would eventually become the winningest class in Tar Heel history was about to play its final game in the Smith Center. A couple of days leading up to it, I couldn't sleep. Uh, I was worried about trying to come up with some way to take some of the pressure off of our kids. Uh, they didn't want to lose on senior day. What it was for with the conference championship, it was Duke. I was just so excited from the moment I woke up. Uh, then just sitting around at home, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't do anything, just wanted to get there. You know, I had so many family coming in. I had people staying at my house, sleeping on my couches and things like that. And, you know, the thing about that is, you know, if it had a little pressure, you know, you don't want to, you know, lose a game and go out to eat with your family and just be, you know, mad the whole time. I didn't want to think about it, you know, before the game or at the time of the game. You know, I just wanted to play basketball and stay focused on the game and winning the game. Yeah, there was just a lot of emotions going through that game, especially, I mean, being senior night. It's Tyler's last game, Danny's last game, one of them go out the right way. I actually got a little emotional out there because, I mean, since I've been here, those guys have been here, you know, and like we've all grown together and they were my big brothers when I got here and we've all grown together. So when they when they had the little ceremony in the beginning, like it was like, man, time flies. After us being announced, you know, at the beginning of the game and your parents being there, you handing the rose to your parents and giving them a hug, it, it definitely hit me. You know, I almost broke down before the game and, and uh, when they announced my name and you know, there's, there's this, you know, I'm ready to play, but, you know, not really ready to leave kind of thing going on. And, you know, when you saw me do my little fist pump, you know, that's me getting ready for the game. I was, you know, I didn't want to wave, or, you know, because I was ready to play. I wasn't really expecting to cry or anything like that, but when they were announcing us before the game and everyone's place is packed, standing, cheering for us, that's, you get a little choked up and you're like, wow, this is pretty special. This is going to be my last time here. You know, it's kind of weird because you put so many hours out there in that gym, you know, in practice by yourself, and you know, you kind of you kind of grow to have a bond. And in a weird way, you kind of you know, have a thing about this this Smith Center where you come in here, and you come in here by yourself. It's some of those things where if you're having a rough day, you come in here late at night and just by yourself, kind of get away and get some free time away from everybody. I know it sounds crazy because you're in here so much, but you know, it's kind of like your second house. You know, to realize that you're moving on and next year you're going to be so far away from a place where you've probably spent, you know, for a period of probably four or five hours a day just working out and doing things. And it was tough. It was our responsibility 
You know, it was, it was, it was something that we had to do, you know, to, to send our seniors out the right way. And I think we, we definitely responded to that the right way. And, you know, we, we took on every challenge and, and we wanted to do it, you know, not only for ourselves, but we, like, we wanted to send those guys out right. Carolina basketball has a long-standing tradition of starting all its seniors on senior day. But with seven seniors, including walk-ons Patrick Moody, J.B. Tanner, and Jack Wooten, the Tar Heel coaching staff had to think of a creative way to get everyone on the floor for tip-off. But once a plan was formulated, there was a slight breakdown in communication. I think Coach Holiday actually forgot to tell us. I think he was supposed to tell us the logistics of it. And I think he forgot because when we went back to the bench after the second time through the layup lines, he said, y'all know what you're doing, right? And we were like, huh, what? What are you talking about? Coach Holiday said, you know what you're doing, right? And I was like, nope. <laughs> like, oh, you're gonna go on the court before the game starts and the referees are gonna tell you to come off the court, it won't be a big deal. And we, JB and Pat and I are like, what? What are you talking about? You know, that's a big deal. When do we come off the court? Where do we stand? And Coach Williams said, well, you're going to go on the court and then, you know, like you're going to start, and then they're going to wave you off right before the tip off and then, you know, just come back over to the sideline when they do that. And I was like, okay, <laughs> sounds good to me. You know, that was a huge thrill. Even though we didn't get to start the game, we were de facto the starters that game. Um, and the crowd was still jumping. Those was a few seconds, you know, you actually feel like you're going to start, but it was just pretty cool to see, be out there right before game time, right before tip-off. And we actually got to go dance a little bit, which is unfortunate now, because that's on tape. So I guess it's a good thing that we that we started for 20 seconds, that saved a little bit of the, of the dancing. First three went in, you know, the second three went in. I was like, huh? I might, I might be feeling it today just a little bit. I really did feel that he would play uh, exceptionally well or really compete that day. I didn't know how uh, fine-tuned he was going to be about making shots and all that, but I knew emotionally and physically he was really into it. wasn't bad, but things just didn't happen for him. And, but he got it loose, and in the second half, he played as good as any point guard I've ever had. I, I think he got to the point where he thought he was unguardable, that he just thought he could take over the game. Flips the double team <laughs> score. Wow, what a play. Once I made that shot, I felt like that um, we won the game, basically, because uh, I mean, you see on their faces, I mean, they played great D that that whole possession. Just to uh, go to the lane and get a foul and, and one, I mean, it's, that's a heartbreaker. Off to Henderson. Henderson to the top of the key. We're inside a minute to play, and we got a jump ball. Carolina ball. Bobby Frazier tied him up. That was a, that was a big time feeling, a big time play. Coach Williams put me in at the end to play defense, of course, to, to do the right thing. And I saw Gerald driving, got my hands in there on the ball. It was a little risky. Uh, but I felt it was a jump ball. The refs saw the same thing, and uh, the crowd got pumped. I was ex I was excited, and uh, it, was a, it was a great feeling. I knew we had the game on, so I was just kind of that was my way of celebrating, uh, you know, winning the game and going out in the Dean Dome in a good note. And uh, you know, that's this is this is going to be you know my last game here, and it's just emotions were flowing. And, that's just my reaction. It was, I was totally spent. There's no question. I don't know that I've ever been emotionally as drained as I was at the end of that day. Um, I just wanted the kids to, I just wanted them to win.
Uh, I probably wouldn't have played in the NCAA tournament the first two games, first three games if I played in the ACC tournament because uh, how bad my foot was. But it was a real good decision not to play in that tournament. I was disappointed because I wanted to win the sucker. There's no question about that. But that's not my biggest goal. It never has been, and it does upset some people during that moment or the, uh, the, uh, the older people who are so uh, uh, enthused about the ACC tournament. But I knew that there was a bigger prize later, and I was, I was uh, disappointed, but I also saw some good things. And I think uh, uh, Justin Watts, Ed, Bobby, Larry getting those extra minutes, I thought in case we needed them later, they were going to be better because of that. Larry. Myself, Ed, we all got big time minutes in those two games. Um, Ed kind of reemerged and was the score that we saw all year and still blocking shots. And then Larry was, you know, showed some glimpses of brilliance when, you know, he's making some great, great assists and, you know, controlling the tempo of the game. And myself, with just having the ball in my hands, it makes me feel a lot more comfortable. And so to get that experience and those big time minutes in a, you know, big time environment really helped us too. All three of those guys, I think, really benefited from having the opportunity to get out on the court and uh, participate and, and be able to, you know, and they had success. We made some plays. We, we screwed up a few things along the way, but uh, uh, for the most part, it was uh, definitely a good, good learning uh, experience for those guys to participate in the games. You know, I took it upon myself to step up, you know, as a leader, you know, try to do whatever I need to do to make sure that we got the win, you know, you know, uh, controlling the speed of the game, you know, getting my teammates shots, you know, pushing the ball, just doing everything that I could do. Here at the other end, Fraser out to Ellington. Is he hot? Yes, he is! Green Ellington for yet another three. Zeller pitches it back out to Green. He's open for three. No good. Missed two in a row. Fraser to inbound, throws the alley-oop, and Danny Green can't get that down. Oh, my goodness. What a frustrating afternoon for Danny Green. He said, I'm, I'm going to stick with you. You know, I'm going to stick with you. You know, just keep playing hard. Don't worry about it. The last shot, focus on the next shot and, and think that it's going in. Even though the next shot didn't go in, you know, I continue to play basketball and try to do other things, you know, defensively to help my team and, and rebound. As a young player, I probably would have been more passive and just got out of the game totally and probably just gave up on the game. But, you know, being here throughout the years and, and matured a lot and just stuck with it and stayed confident a little bit or, you know, just keep sticking it out and not worrying about the last play helped me get through those games. I know you're competitive, and you know at the time I was really mad we lost, and, but in a way I thought it made us better just because, you know, we got hungry and we started focusing on the little things again. You know, we didn't harp on it. We didn't, you know, let it bring us down or let it let it get us down. You know, we we came in here and we were ready to work. You know, we knew that we had the big tournament in front of us and looked to get Taiwan back and and just go into the to the to NCAA tournament and just dominate there. You know, we beat Virginia Tech when they have everything on the line and we have the last shot that we could have uh, gotten Florida State when things didn't go well for us at all, but we still had Ty Lawson and we didn't put him in jeopardy uh, by playing in the tournament and possibly hurting him when we wouldn't have had him later on. And if we don't have him later on, we don't win a national championship. Carolina entered the NCAA tournament as the number one seed in the South region and earned the right to play close to home in Greensboro. All was not settled with the Tar Heels though, as Ty Lawson's health and availability remained in question. I had really thought very seriously about holding him out uh, uh, even Sunday night and Monday. Uh, but as we got a little bit closer to that game, I thought this is not only something we should do, uh, but that we needed to do because I just didn't think he was ready. I mean, even though he wanted to win the championship so bad, I mean, he still cares about my health and well-being that um, 
he didn't want to put me in a position to hurt myself. So I mean, it, it speaks volumes of what type of person he is. The emails and the phone calls from people who are who are truly concerned about wanting him to get back and perform well, and they have the answer for you, and they want you to try it. And we had numerous things that were sent our way, or, or calls and emails, just to say, try this, try that. Have you looked at this? Have you looked at that? Put him in the pool before the games, early in the morning after breakfast, after the game, you know, to restore motion, unload the, unload the, the toe, unload the joint, so. We've gotta be able to get past ever who the 16 seed is. And so I initially I'd wanted to do it just to give him that other two days. Uh, but as time got closer, I felt like it was the right thing to do as well. I think it was good. The kids did feel good about uh, uh, going to Greensboro for the first two rounds. It's your last go at it. Um, everything you want is focused toward winning the basketball game. I mean, Radford was excited to play us. I mean, they, they don't get to play us, you know, you know every year. Here's Green, cross-court pass on the right to Frazier. Down inside Hansbro, got free, and then got held by Martin. Well, if he puts in both of these free throws that he's about to take, he will have set the new record, Woody. Free throw up, he's got it! You look at all the players that played in the ACC, all the great scorers, and people that could really shoot, and for me to be the top, you know, I thought that was very special. Going into the tournament, I felt great. So I just wanted to come out and, you know, and just play a pretty good floor game. You know, I didn't want to take any bad shots, take any four shots. I just want to play within the flow and, um, and, and take things from there. And I, I think, you know, as a result of that, you know, that first game, um, built my confidence even more, and I just started rolling through the tournament. Caught by Copeland, and he gets the dunk. <laughs> and Carolina comes out victorious by 43. That was the first game he's tried to come back, and. Uh, didn't play very well again in the first half. And he comes out of the game with that toe, and I'm sitting next to him, and I say, what do you think? And he said, oh, this hurts more than anything I've ever had in my life. Once it popped and I hopped over to the bench, I thought I was going to be done for the game because I, I really couldn't walk. I mean, it, it hurt at first for like the first four minutes. It just hurt, it was painful. So, I mean, I really thought I was gonna be out for the game. Lawson has his shoe off on the Carolina bench. He appears to be in some pain. Chris Hurt, the trainer, is over and speaking to him. A lot of people would be right on down that bench with the trainer and have that shoe off and stay there the rest of the game. He rubbed it a little bit, put some uh, ointment on it. And um, when Coach Holiday Fort well, basically came down and said, are you ready? And I just say yeah without even thinking about it and I uh, just ran the game. With Lawson back, the Tar Heels took a nine-point lead into the halftime locker room. But LSU opened the second half on a 13-3 run, giving the Tigers the advantage and prompting Roy Williams to take a rare early timeout to challenge his team. And Roy Williams has asked for a timeout, and he is not the least bit happy. He told us, he said, hey, do you want your career to end right now? He looked at me, Tyler, and Danny. He said, you guys want your season to end tonight because if you keep playing the way you, the way you are. And I didn't think we were competing. I thought Taz Mitchell was being more physical than we were. And then I think when we were trying to double and rotate, we were doing it hesitantly. And it's something that I can't stand. If, you're going to, if we're going to play, let's play aggressively. If you're going to do something, do it as aggressively as you possibly can. We can't let this happen. So, you know, every loose ball was kind of going after, trying to get every ball, trying to play some better defense. And, but, uh, you know, they, they played pretty good there in the se second half. And, you know, eventually, you know, like I said, Ty kind of took over there in a little bit. And I told him, I said, I remember the Duke game. And uh, at home on senior day, you didn't play as well in the first half, but you were great in the second half. You're going to be great right now. So I just kept replaying that quote in my head and uh, just started playing a lot better. Lawson can't go. Now we'll take an outside shot. Good! It's a three by Ty Lawson. Mitchell's pass inside to Quentin Thornton, stolen away. Here's Lawson splitting the double team, scoops it up, it goes, and he's fouled. Lawson works baseline, goes underneath, scoops it up, and it goes. Lawson bringing it. By the end of that game, you're like, this is one really tough kid. You know, because you know it was painful, but he fought through it. And I mean, just think of all the cutting and change of direction, stopping, jumping. He'd already made up his mind after the Kansas game. 
last year that nothing was going to keep him out of these six games. Nothing. People were taking shots at him, you know, questioning his toughness. And, and I think, you know, the LSU game, you know, I think that, that put all those questions to rest. When he came back and played that way against LSU, his own teammates said, OK, Duke at Duke. Duke at home the second half. At Miami the second half. LSU the second half. That his teammates put him on a different level. And the guy saw his competitive desire and his uh, willingness to play through some pain and, and try and get out there for the team. I think you earned a lot of respect from the staff and the players. He just enjoyed the year. I would say that's the biggest thing. I mean, his freshman year it was a struggle to get him to smile or, you know, act like he wanted to be at practice. And this year, he was always laughing, joking. Ty is always trying to get everybody. I mean, one time at halftime, Ty went to almost everybody's seat and put water in everybody's seat. <laughs> Love to have fun, but when he got on the court, I mean, he was a serious player. I mean, he would just do anything for us, his team to win. That's why I want to be remembered as. Here come the Tar Heels on the run. Lawson the drive up off the glass, and it's good. Boy, that speed will hurt you a lot of times. Taiwan is a ball possession guard in a very fast tempo. All right, which means, again, he's going to push it as far as he can take it himself. And if somebody takes that away, then he's going to make the play. All right, or he's pushing, he sees somebody open, he's just going to instinctively give it up. And I think the one thing this year, his instinctive plays were all at the right time. He knows I'll make the right play every time and I try to do his best for the team to win. So, I mean, ha him having faith and trust in me, I mean, means the world to me. Everything that a point guard should do, he did and went beyond that. I got to show that I'm calm, even if I'm not. Because if I show him rattled, then everybody else might get rattled. So. I mean, I just try to get a good shot when we come down court, and uh, normally they'll knock it in because it'd be in a good situation. I have never had a guard. I have never seen a guard at that fast a tempo have anywhere close to that assist air ratio. All those guys who are close to him never played at a really fast tempo. I try to have zero turnovers and uh, get everybody involved. I try to get everybody assists. So I mean, all that, all my performance was just for our team to win. I mean, I won. I just went so bad and. Uh, I just try to take it upon my shoulders to do what I need for us to win. But I can't imagine any point guard playing any better the last four games in the NCAA tournament since Isaiah Thomas in 1981. That's a big compliment coming from Coach, uh, especially uh, Isaiah Thomas. He's a great player. But um, that performance, I just, I just wanted to do anything for my team to win. He was 100% committed to doing everything he needed to do for this team to succeed. It'll go down as you know, one of the best NCAA performances ever. I mean, I really wanted to win this tournament. I mean, once we got there, I mean, that's what I came back to school for. I really wanted to win a championship. The Tar Heels traveled to Memphis, where they faced Gonzaga, a team which still had several of the players that helped upset Carolina during an 06-07 preseason NIT matchup in New York. The Tar Heels, and in particular Tyler Hansbro, remembered that loss vividly as they prepared for the rematch in the Sweet 16. If you remind Tyler of that stuff too much, I think he would explode just waiting to get out there on the floor. You don't think he remembered uh, that game and that feeling after that game? Come on. <laughs> he knew. And uh, does Tyler want to settle the score? Yes, he did. <laughs> there's, there's no shirt. Sure, you know, we were all pissed off when they beat us in New York, upset. I think Hyde felt, you know, had a real good game, and he was going at me. And I think there was some talk about Ty Lawson and Pargo matchup. You know the way they played when we played them two years ago. You know they got us good. They got us real good, and you know they're going to come in with confidence and they're going to play well against us. So, you know, I, I didn't want to come out and, and be relaxed. I want to come out and attack and, and be aggressive. And, uh, and I think the rest of the team had the same concept. I felt like Gonzaga game. I was just playing my game. You know, it came out early where I think the time somebody found me for a backdoor, you know, easy two-point dunk. And I think that kind of got me going. I just, you know, got comfortable. And then after that, I was just losing myself within the game and playing basketball. You know, just, you know, finding my teammates early on. I think I had a lot of easy bas easy assists, you know, finding Ed and Dion and, and Tyler. Of course, easy assist on Tyler because he's always putting the ball in the basket. I reminded everybody before every game, I was like, don't, we don't need to come out like the Kansas game. We was down almost 30 points, so 
Uh, those, that's what contribute to the hot starts. I mean, because everybody wanted to come out strong. Davis spins on down, puts up the left-handed shot, good. Lawson trying to penetrate, takes it inside, scoops it up and in. Tries to drive, can't get through, bounce pass to Ellington. Ellington backing away, the long three is good. Wayne Ellington was a big time shot. Ball outside, tipped away by Ellington, off to Lawson. Lawson on the drive, scooped it up, it's good, and he's fouled, and foul hard. In college basketball now, sort of copy after the NBA, the screen on the point of the ball is very difficult to cover. So you have to decide, okay, who is the threat? Is it the ball, the dribbler, or is it the roll man, or the slip guy? And with Gonzaga, a CBS head coach, there's no question it's the slip guy. It's a height felt, it's downs, it's those guys slipping to the goal. And so we chose to squeeze and, and go under. The only danger is the person could stop behind the screen and shoot. I think they made two baskets the whole game doing that. But uh, I'm sure they were expecting us to step out and hedge, and they'd set a game plan that way. And so I thought that was a whole uh, one of the keys to the game was to keep get their dribble penetration under control by squeezing and going behind. Now to Lawson. Here's Fraser for three. Good, Bobby Fraser. Ellington on the run out, coming front court. Here's Bobby Fraser. Launches another one. That one is good too. Those runs just kill people. You can see in their eyes. I mean, they're happy to get almost. They're down five or something like that. Then we go on a 9-0 run, I mean, it just kills on me. I see how it, how it does, um, would kill them, because, uh, I mean, they just did all that hard work, and then they're down 13 again or something like that. Those runs are, I mean, they're just killers. Oh, I think I got it. I think I got it. Oh, oh, there it is. Yeah! Oh, God. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> Carolina advanced to the round of eight, where it faced Oklahoma, a team which featured National Player of the Year Blake Griffin. The Tar Heels adjusted their defensive scheme in hopes of limiting Griffin's effectiveness. You know, the scouting report says we do want to double down on him, but we want to go on the first move. I said, let's give it a little more emphasis than that because I felt like he could get 40. And, you know, there's no way you're going to stop him. He's too big, too explosive, and, and they go to him too often, and he gets too many calls. Our normal rule was go halfway and wait till there's moving and jam down. And so I said, no, let's just go completely. And doing that, we had to work on a rotation. We double Blake every time he caught the basketball, and then you have to decide, okay, what do you want to do with the rest of it? So we decided to come off of the guy who passed it in to double. And then everybody else rotate around, and the man who was the first trapper coming down would take the guy on the opposite side after the ball came out. So it was complete rotation. The perimeter guys took such great pride in getting there and being there on the catch in our rotation that they didn't get many good looks in the first half. And then when they did get a good look, they missed it. Austin Johnson bringing it front court down to Blake Griffin. Back it goes to Johnson. Out and out of Willie Warren. Warren on the drive. Lost the ball off his knee and it's out of bounds to Carolina. Johnson down low to Blake Griffin. Back out it comes to Johnson. Johnson top of the key. Gives it back to Griffin. Griffin moves and knocked away by Hansbro. Hansbro doubled down on it. Now here's Lawson coming front court. Lawson with a jumper. Good. Took Blake out of the game. He just stood there the first half when he caught the ball. He just stood when he caught the ball, waiting on the double to come because he knew he was going to get double. Now to Crocker. Crocker on the wing to Blake Griffin. Griffin caught up in a double team. Griffin at the sideline, got it to Crocker. And there's a shot clock violation on the Sooners. The attention to detail was far greater because they knew that this is it. And so all of a sudden in the first half, we got we get two, three shot clock violations because guys are in the right spot, guys are flying around. We didn't have many shot clock violations uh, this, this whole year. And so to see that we were playing defense for 35 seconds, everyone was invested in it, uh, it was pretty cool. I knew it was going to be a rough, physical, grinded out type of game. That's what I thought it was going into it. So I just tried to do little things, you know, you know to get, get involved and be scrappy and just jump in there and get some rebounds, get some steals and knock down some shots. Trying to get in the lane, drives the runner, good, Danny Green. Lawson on the drive into the lane, faking, shoots it out to Danny Green, three on the way, good. Danny Green for three. To Green, now Green goes baseline, jumper, good, off the glass. Now Justin Watts to Tyler Zeller, underneath the Hansbro for the dunk. Tyler Hansbro, uh, you know, if you read the papers and all this, he was outplayed so, 
so much by Blake Griffin, and he just shown him up, showed him up. And uh, Tyler took four shots that game. He had eight points, but he only took four shots. And uh, the other guys were the ones that were hitting the buckets. If it would have been my freshman year, I probably would have tried to go at him one on one every possession. But I think I matured and uh, you know realized you know there's something more important here. You know, that's winning a national championship. It just showed um, how diverse of a team we were and how many weapons we really had on the team. Even Ed stepped up, so I mean, he had other players that can score probably 20 points any given night, probably five or six of them. All right, now let me understand this right here, too, because I'm going to add something to you. We did this. Now let's go and play our tails off. Last year, what did we do? We went out soft. We've all remembered that. Everybody's, it's been in your mind, it's been in the back of my mind. For 360 some days, we went in soft. We're not going to freaking go in soft this time. If somebody beats us, they're going to beat us. But it's not because we're going in soft. We went to this final dance last year. This time we're not going to go just to go. We have a purpose in mind. I don't think we're quite as giddy about playing in the Final Four um, this season as we were last season. We were just so in awe by the whole thing, just all the people and all the excitement and everything that was going around around the Final Four. You got so sidetracked with that, with forgetting that, oh man, you still gotta play a basketball game. We walked out and we're looking around saying, gosh, we're at the Final Four, and Kansas hit us right in the mouth. The way we lost, the style we lost, and to be almost embarrassed out there on one of the biggest stages in college basketball really just filled us. I think it was always in front of our mind is, you know, when we got back to the tournament, that was going to motivate us. I really truly believe that, you know, we, we definitely learned from our mistakes, and when we got there, and this year when we got to the Final Four, we just, you know, we were hungry. You know, we didn't look back. We, we didn't want to have to regret anything. Everyone, you had to focus. No one was joking around. There was no plan around nothing. Everyone was just, we were there for one reason, that was just to win it all. When you really want to take something, you have to believe you can get it. Coach did a really great job of helping us believe that we could win it this year. I did emphasize all year long, from the first game through Boston College at home, Wake Forest at Wake Forest, that our dreams and goals were realistic. It wasn't uh, a chance. It wasn't a guess. It wasn't something that was way out there unreachable. So the week before going to Detroit, it was a little bit of remember what our dreams and goals are. Our focus was how good they were defensively. What we had practiced for that week was scoring out of our team offense and not just four guys standing around watching one. From the start, we had talked about let's go inside and kind of establish ourselves there because they lacked some size and they weren't that big. We got off to a pretty good start inside. Pressure, here's the drop pass. Oh, great ball movement by the Tario. Thompson recovers, scores, and gets fouled. Our bigs really do. Every day in practice, we work hard together and we get better together. And it shows on the court that we can all play together and, and take care of the right assignments that we need to do while we're out there. They knew that they didn't have the, the size that we had. So uh, they, they, were, they were doubling down, throwing guys into the post. And we did throw it in Tyler, Dion, Ed, um, Zells. And then they would just throw it back out. And, uh, you know, they, they weren't rotating too fast. So, um, you know, when they threw it out, you know, of course, all he says, it goes in, comes back out, look to knock it down. So, you know, that's what we did. Boy, Wayne Ellington looks very, very comfortable on the floor tonight. I think they were so worried about our inside that they forgot we had all those talented shooters on the perimeter. And those guys, were, they were, I remember now, they were knocking down a lot of threes that game. And that wasn't even our game plan. It was to get the ball inside. But when you're shooting the ball like that, you might as well not st stop shooting, just keep on putting them up. You know, when we do knock down one or two or two in a row, uh, you know, I think teams start to feel like, you know, you, you know, oh, guys, you know, this could get ugly. And I feel like, you know, when we're clicking from the inside and then, you know, Danny and myself and, and Taiwan and knocking down shots from the outside, you know, I feel like teams, you know, they feel like we can't be stopped. It's a wide open, dreams the three. Lawson whips it over to Danny Green, and he's open for the three. Good! Danny Green. All Danny four Green. of his baskets have been three-pointers, Eric. Here's Redding for three. Good! And it's a seven-point game. Turns. 
can't get through, trying to drive on Hansbro, got by him. They feed it now to Clark, the jumper is good, and it's a five-point game. We knew they was the type of team that, that was going to continue to fight and continue to grind it out. When they cut it to five the next time out, that's what we talked about is, hey, I can tell you it's going to be easy. It's not supposed to be easy. If you want to win the biggest prize, you got to play. We could recall on the experiences of previous times and Okay, let's settle down, let's go play. You just gotta keep going, keep grinding it out till you find your rhythm. If the team's making a run at us, they got the lead or they got the momentum on their side, they're like, hey, we can do this, we can do this. But then if we never really lose our poise, we kind of just have that, all right, let's go about our business, then boom, boom, boom. Nine points and three possessions like that can really, really hurt the team psyche. We just wanted to, you know, keep playing that well and keep doing the things that we were doing, you know, instead of you know, getting comfortable and saying, you know, we got this lead, you know, we're going to the championship game uh, too early. So we, we want to keep on, you know, attacking. To Lawson, outside three, no good. Fraser with a rebound. I told Bobby I thought he should have been player of the game against Villanova. Five offensive rebounds. I said, you broke their heart. Every time, every time they stopped us from scoring, you chased it down. We got another shot. Fraser again with a loose ball. And you know, and he provided that little spark at time period for us just by sheer effort. Last year I didn't get to play, so I ran out into that court just with a smile on my face. Uh, I'm so happy to be there and then be a key contributor in that win. Uh, is even makes the feeling even that much better. College player, that's what you what you talk about being the whole year. So, you know, for me, I just thought about the game. I couldn't sleep. It was funny. Ty couldn't eat, <laughs> and uh, he's like, I "Can't eat." I'm just, I guess I don't know why I can't eat. Like, you're excited. I couldn't eat this morning. Come to the game, I was really anxious. Just wanted to see like how it was to play in front of that many people. Because I think the biggest crowd we had was probably like 25,000. The whole city was just alive. I mean, you saw all green people walking down the whole street. We were watching it on the news, their fans all outside, screaming and yelling. We had this mentality of us versus the world. And everyone wanted Michigan State to win. It was going to fix the economy, this and that. And so for us to be on the road playing in front of 60,000 Michigan State fans uh, really raised our level of play. When you come to Carolina, you come to win championships. And we want to leave our mark. You know, the seniors worked so hard. They've been through so much. And, um, you know, I think everybody was just hungry. I always think it's good to be the underdog when you're really good. After the Villanova game, I said, guys, people say you can't beat somebody twice or three times. You can beat them 20 times in a row if you're better. All the green people in the green shirts aren't going to come down and play. And I like this scenario because people say you can't do it, but we can do it. And I said one other thing that I thought was important. We're better. We're better than we are. Now let's go play. I thought Dion's buckets were maybe the most important for us. Here's Thompson to the baseline. Spins toward the lane. The soft jumper is good. They were emphasizing covering Tyler so much that Dion was always just one on one, and there was nobody coming towards it. He's a big body, and his arms are long. That he gets easy shots. In the first half, that's what he did. He posted real deep, got easy layups, and then when I drove, I mean, he stepped out, knocked down a shot. Hands pro down to Dion Thompson, lays it up, gets fouled by Suton. His play was uh, uh, so crucial to us in the first half because now, you know, they've got to guard everybody. They can't cheat off of anybody. If I'm scoring the ball like that and guys are getting defensive stops and I come down and score again, and then Tyler scores, and then Ty drives past you, and then Wayne shoots a three in this corner, and then Danny shoots a three in that corner, <laughs> pick your poison. Okay, give it to Ellington, long outside shot, good! Oh. Oh. Oh, a high arcing three from right in front of the Michigan State bench. We just buried it from, from the jump, uh, you know, from the lead to go to 10, to 15, to 20. As quickly as it did, it just kind of took the crowd out of the game, it took them out of the game, and basically the game was over in the first half. Ty was more active, and yet Ty was in the right place at the right time. 
you know, Ty was being Dennis the Menace back there, and they throw the ball in bounds, and he was stealing, stealing balls, and you know, then finish the plays. And... To the right comes left to Lucas. Ball stolen away by Lawson. Out front on the run out to Wayne Ellington for the two-handed jam. And this was like a team that everybody expected to play like the whole year. It's like, you know, yeah, we've gotten a little better each game, but that was kind of our peak where we hit as a team. And, you know, that's, that was probably the best that we could play. Kind of didn't believe it. it. You know, it didn't hit me. I'm like, it didn't really seem like a national championship game because of just how the game was going. This uh, Michigan State game, I didn't look up at the score the entire first half, but I knew we were doing pretty well. And so I went in the, uh, the coach's little uh, locker room and I said, what is the score? And they said it was 21. And uh, so to me, it was, uh, as you said, it was not a perfect half, but uh, for the national championship game, it was a perfect half. And I believe in the hereafter. I know what we were here after. And for us, at halftime, it was more the same thing is that, guys, that makes no difference. They're going to come back. They're going to make a little run if you allow them to make runs. And uh, for me, our want to, before the game, I said, has to exceed theirs. And at halftime, I said, it has to exceed theirs. When you're up 20 points and uh, you know that you have the game in your hands, um, it's tough because the other team's fighting. At the same time, you're trying to manage the clock, but also, you know, try to continue to attack. But you don't want to do anything Stupid, so you're playing a little tentative. That light switch was on in the first half, and we probably put it about medium in the second half. That was discouraging me because I wanted us to keep being aggressive, to keep attacking. And at almost every time out from the 16 and on down, that was what I was saying. You know, let's keep attacking, let's keep attacking. Lawson with a steal on the outlet pass by Summers. Now Lawson in the right corner, gets it down to Ed Davis. Davis up for the shot, scores and got fouled. I think we came out so juiced and so ready to play that our second half was like, man, we already did our damage. It was just now time to just make sure we do the right things, play smart basketball, and get this thing over with so we can get this national championship. I knew we won the game whenever uh, Bobby got that steal and made the layup. And then I saw, I think Coach kind of threw in the subs to end out the game and uh, going over to the sideline to realize that we had won the game. And, hugging all the coaches and jumping around with, with my teammates. And that, that was, that was uh, probably the, the best way to celebrate for me. That big grin on his face and he hugged me and it almost knocked me down kind of thing. And uh, uh, I've never seen the look of joy on a kid's face like that in my entire life. And at that moment, I realized uh, what that game meant to me. If you put 10 million, 50 million dollars over there, that say, Roy, well, you can have that, but if you take that, you forget the feeling that you had when Tyler Hansbro hugged me. I don't care how much money it is, you can keep that. And yet, I was so focused on winning the game that I didn't even realize until he hugged me that we're gonna win the national championship. It was, in a way, kind of hard to control ourselves, you know, on the sideline for those, you know, those minutes or seconds. And you know, all that, that hard work and you know, all this rough seasons, the rough games and you know, injuries before the season, injuries during the season, things like that, you know, all, all made sense at the end. And how about the Tar Heels? They are the national champions. It's a real moment. I mean, running on the court, hugging everybody, uh, jumping up and down, just celebrating. I mean, it just felt real good. Um, all our hard work we did paid off. I was just proud, you know, of you know, everything that we did as a team. You know, honestly, I can't, I don't even want to think about it. <laughs> I'm getting emotional right now, but it, it's to this day, man, when I think about that, I'm, I get cold chills and I start thinking about all the work we put in and where we started from. You know, it's something that, it's truly amazing. I love him. <laughs> I remember him yelling, you're a national champion. You know, a national champion, like, yeah, I can't believe you're dead. You know, I never really see, you know, your dad in tears. And so for a basketball game to bring that emotion out of him, um, for me to play well, to win a national championship, cut down a piece in the net, 
turn over and look at my family and, and hold that net up for them. Uh, you know, it's it's something I'm never I'm never gonna forget. For all our family supported us, and they were very happy for for all of us. You know, I'm sure they're all happy for me as well as they're happy for Wayne, Tyler, Ty, Dion. For them to be there, you know, meant a lot to all of us, and for him to be there meant a lot to me. And I just was happy that he was happy and he's proud, you know, of me. I didn't believe this team was destined to win, but I thought it was the right thing, and uh, sometimes the right thing does happen. It was the best journey in my life. I'm sure that's that I'm ever gonna have ever again. And that's something that nobody can ever, ever take away from us. You know, we, we worked so hard and we've been through so much, so many ups and downs and, and we did it. You know, <laughs> There's nothing anybody can say now. No, we did it. something like that and uh, just being followed all the way from the airport and you know, just people on the side of the road, you know, hanging flags out their window. It was unbelievable how many people was out there just uh, waiting to shake our hand and uh, just to look at the bus and just wave at the bus. It was just crazy to see how the whole town, um, you know, the whole state just, just embraced, uh, you know, us as national champions and uh, it was just a, a huge celebration and um, it was just great to see smiles on everybody's face. What better way to start this afternoon than how about them Tar Heels? And last night, a fifth NCAA title and a sixth national championship. We did it, y'all. We did it, y'all. We did it, baby. But the way we did it, though, you see how we did it? Thank you, thank you. And being able to put that banner up there beside that one is a direct tribute to all the hard work, all the sweat, the running, the lifting, the listening to me yell at them, complain and push them. But these young men now are tied in together for the rest of their lives. They've been on a magical run. And as I said last night, they took me for a fantastic ride. And I loved every minute of it.
Thank you. Carolina's ride did not end with the gathering in the Smith Center. A few weeks later, the Tar Heels were invited to the house of one of their old pickup game partners to commemorate the title. Of course, this visit was a little out of the ordinary since that house address was 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. and the old pickup partner was President Barack Obama. Welcome to the White House, everybody. Uh, and congratulations on bringing Carolina its fifth national championship. And more importantly, thanks for salvaging my bracket. Uh, now, when we played, everybody went out of their way to pass me the ball, set screens for me, let me take a shot. Uh, Tyler chose not to block my shot. He, of course, I was so intimidated by him being near me that I missed it. Uh, there wasn't one exception, though. Uh, Jack Wooden, he stole the ball from me. He blocked my shot. He fouled me once. Coach Williams had to remind him that there are a bunch of guys with guns around. On behalf of Chancellor Holden Thorpe, our Director of Athletics, Dick Bedour, and the 2009 National Championship North Carolina basketball team, we would like to present to you, Mr. President, your own jersey. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Two thousand and nine was a special year for Carolina basketball. Scores of individual awards and records, thirty or more wins for the third consecutive season, a twenty seventh ACC regular season title, an eighteenth Final Four, and the program's sixth national championship, including its second NCAA title in the past five years. And on the night of April sixth, after the national championship game in the Tar Heel locker room deep inside Ford Field. Roy Williams reminded his team that that night and this season would be one they would never forget. North Carolina basketball is Dean Smith, Phil Ford, Michael Jordan, Sean May, Raymond Felton, and for the rest of your lives, North Carolina basketball is going to be you guys. It's going to be the 2009 North Carolina basketball team, national champions. And when those guys, when Raymond and Sean and those guys come back and start saying, they can't say anything. They can't say anything. It's not any good. Because you got the ring and you got the banner. And for 50 years from now, I won't be there, but 50 years from now, when they have another reunion, 2059. <laughs> oh, wow. Just remember that nobody, that night when you go out on the court, you're 72, 73, 74 years old, you go out there and remember one thing. That no coach has ever felt more privileged. No coach has ever felt more proud of a team that handled things like you did. The adversity, the injuries, the other people's expectations. I honestly feel like I'm the luckiest coach that has ever lived. And not just because of this net. Now, this is a big part of it. But each day, I love you. And now they're going to always say that 2009 bunch can play their butts off. How about them Tar Heels, boys? Yeah. One more bump, yeah!